Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our panel on the future of work for women through and post the pandemic. I'm Robert Baker, CEO of Potential Talent Consulting. I've had a long uh, relationship with Financial Alliance for Women and really keen to support the great work that they're doing in enabling financial institutions to become the employers of choice for women. Uh, so we want to build on that fabulous last panel about building the Jedi workforce of tomorrow uh, with a session about what it's really going to mean for women in the world of work um, as we emerge from the, from the pandemic. And I'm delighted to be joined uh, by four experts here in different uh, aspects. I've got Somi Ariane, founder and CEO of Fempeak. I have Matt Tuck, head of commercial customer propositions and delivery for NatWest Group. I have Daniel Shariah, chief human resource officer at Bank al -Atihad. And last but definitely not least, I have Kirsty Levers, Group Head of Culture, Inclusion and Diversity at AXA. So in this session, we're bringing together these experts on the future of work. Uh, we've got futurist, customer propositions, HR, diversity, inclusion experts. So we've got a variety of different perspectives on how these latest transformations are going to affect women. In the, in the future of work. And in particular, we want to look at aspects like, for example, remote and hybrid working in the new normal and the demand for new skills and new ways of working. So we're gonna run the panel for about 25 minutes. We're then gonna invite you to raise your questions from the audience. Please use the chat function to raise your questions in advance so we can get a sense of what you want to discuss uh, and then we'll come to you uh, at that time. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap up and uh, we'll, we'll have begun good to go in 40 minutes. So I'm going to kick off straight away um, by going to Somi and asking you, Somi, um, to kick us off with really, I guess the question is, what's the biggest challenge that you see for women in the future of work through and, and post the pandemic? Sure. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me. So, um, as you know, I call myself a tech philosopher, you know, like I look at the philosophy of technology and how it's changing uh, the human uh, human history, you know, for the first time in history, as I said, we are emerging with technology in a new way, in a way that we have never done before. And women are at a very interesting and important crossroad. When I, uh, I was writing a book about the future of work in 2019, when I was writing that book, I was looking at a transition of five to 15 years for what is uh, about to happen. But actually what the pandemic has done, it has increased uh, the speed of that transition. So now we are looking at one to five years rather than five to 15 years. So some of those changes are now happening within the next two to three years. Some of them are already happening. I remember very early on, uh, early days of the pandemic, one of the things that I read at the uh, in The Economist was that there were certain uh, automation that was being done, uh, planned in China in factories for the, for the next five years, and they have now been brought forward to happen within the next one or two years. So what the impact of that for women is huge because not only the speed of technological uh, change and advancement has uh, really like ex exponentially grown so fast, but also because of the pandemic, women have had a setback in uh, you know being able to uh, close the skills gap that that was already there. So basically, women were already falling behind in terms of uh, any everything to do with finance and technology stem in general and the pandemic has accelerated that so beyond the fact that now women are staying at home more and you know having to juggle family and life the biggest worry and challenge that i see here is how are we going to close that gap in such a short space so i hope that yeah. answers your question you know that's fantastic so you got us off to a great start matt let's bring you in here to get your perspective um maybe from natwest as well on, on on what you're thinking about as the future of work and the challenges for women yeah thank you Roman, and thank you for inviting me to the panel and i, I agree with Sony. i think it is a, a unique opportunity that we're staring into now that the the negatives of covid are far hopefully now outweighed by the positive opportunity we have to make a real difference in this space if I look at what we did here at NatWest, we managed to get all of our employees working from home uh, pretty much over a week, over one weekend. Uh, we never would have done that had it not been for the pandemic. We were forced to do that. Um, the challenge now is how do, we, how do we bring back those colleagues to a new hybrid way of working and don't miss the unique opportunity that we have to um, meet the expectations of, of our colleagues and looking at it through, through a gender lens that one size fit does not fit all. So how do we make sure that we don't use this, lose this unique opportunity 
for colleagues as they as we can support them in finding the right hybrid model for them and it will be different for every colleague um, and so not jump to the wrong conclusions and make mistakes now that's the biggest challenge getting it right and not missing the opportunity great thanks very much uh, let's turn then to daniel to get your perspective because you're an hr expert but also you're working in uh, the arab countries right so it'd be lovely to get your perspective on how you're seeing this issue for the future of women in work Thank you, Robert, for having me. Salam. Uh, so the biggest challenge that used to have uh, in our part of the world is uh, women participation uh, at large. We have uh, very low participation uh, rates in the Arab world. And in Jordan, it's uh, less than 14% of the workforce, which is not a good number. Uh, the uh, pandemic did a good effect in some weird way, where uh, remote working gave women more options and more uh, flexibility, which exactly what they what they needed. In Bank al Ittihad, we have a higher uh, percentage of women in the workforce than the whole country. We're almost at uh, 49, 50 percent, which is one of the biggest, uh, highest number in the country. And uh, to do this flip uh, uh, because of the pandemic and have that flexibility, it was a, a life changing uh, event in a positive manner. And our hopes now for the future is to keep it up. Great, no, thank you. Um, so Kirsty, let's come to you because uh, you're looking at this from the diversity and inclusion perspective. What, what do you see as the challenges for the uh, women in the future of work? Hi, thanks, Robert. And Daniel gave me the perfect opening to say, how do we rebound off of that right now? For me, the biggest challenge is to take advantage of this window. And, and Somi kind of really brought it home to me when she said, we've got between one and five years. For me, the challenge for all of us is how to make that change happen because my job's change management and we know that change takes a super long time particularly cultural uh, revolutionary change like we're trying to make now to the workplace to, to women's role in the workplace to everybody's relationship with the office and what the covid crisis did deal or sustainable but it was possible and that changes the way that we look at the need to be in and as daniel said it gives us lots more opportunities it offers the workplace to more people but when we bring people back right now and that's so is magic one to five years we have to rebuild the workplace in a better way and that's the challenge because if we get this wrong we go back to how we've always been and we lose we lose that window we go back to, to to fighting still for inequality in the workplace for making work accessible to giving flexibility that opens it up to towards so many people or i mean there's a chance that we rebuild it even worse <laughs> so yeah. picking up that point we were quick to get people working remotely we were quick to announce to all of our employees in 54 countries that we were very much open to remote working when people come back so we expect people back in the office because that's important but we expect people and i really rebound on what matt said to create what the new world of work looks like for them but that's a huge challenge so from a change management point of view now within these years we've got to help people build their own way of coming back to work and help them build it in an equal way and in a way that supports everybody's ability to work in a way that, that works best for them. So right now, AXA, we're working with our teams to recreate a new way of working that we call SMART. SMART because it has to be different to everybody. And SMART because it will mix hybrid, but we're still working out exactly the right way for every single person. We just know that office stays, working remotely stays, and we've got to get the mix right. Uh, and Kirsty, just to pick up on that point about um, you know what women in, 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 are experiencing in, in the office now. I mean, we we see that there's going to be less face time potentially in the office uh, for for women. So how do we support them uh, to kind of you know thrive in their careers and move up the ladder, as we call it? Uh, you know, if they're trying to uh, you know they've got a care burdens at home and they're, and they're struggling to get into the office to get face time. What what would you say to that? Uh, now you motivate me on complete societal change because. We've had a lot of years of believing that being in the office, like being in a factory, is set hours on set days in a set way. And for historical reasons, some people, usually men or without children, have been more easily able to do that than women have. And women have stereotypically taken the role of being there for children and being there for family. I kind of think, and I look at you men that are here in, the, in time with your family, that you also take care of your family and your, your dependent people. But maybe you had less choice in the past. So I think that the, as we rebuild, 
what can't happen, and the women really have to help us with this, but the men too, is that we can't go back to those traditional roles. We have to make the flexibility for everybody. When we make flexibility, it's not for women, it's for everybody. And everybody needs to take advantage. And that's a game that we need to play together. Because if we make being, if we make FaceTime the most important thing again, then we exclude people again. And that's why this is a really delicate moment because somehow together, and it relies on all of us, we need to find a balance that makes us all fulfilled and rounded people that have family time as well as work time. I yes. believe that men want that as well as women. So yeah. it's about uh, rebuilding it in the right way. It looks so, like Matt agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's certainly not going to say Matt, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I was going to say, actually, I completely agree. I, I think it is for everybody. Um, I think one of the key areas of focus, certainly for us, is as we look at hybrid working, how do we create a learning culture um, and a growth culture that allows individuals to develop and learn at their own pace? And that isn't just... Um, employees it's across the piece so we need to we need to train our leaders um, and our leadership needs to show um, um, you know the, the right way to do this because the default will happen often by the tone set from the leader within the team whether it's the top of the organization or through the organization so but just assuming that our leaders know how to do this and, and how to help colleagues whether they're men or women um, find a, a better hybrid working um, relationship with their organization cannot be assumed we have to give them the skills so one of the things we're spending a lot of time on is that learning environment not just within the employees themselves but across our leadership structures as well super thanks Matt and let's bring in Daniel for, to get your regional perspective as well as your HR perspective Daniel what, what, what do you see in terms of the challenges of uh, supporting uh, women as we kind of potentially have a situation of less face time in the office and, uh, and and you know this more care burdens at home issue um, it's so funny that uh, what my colleagues are saying is is awesome and amazing and currently we're proposing it right like it's an option i think in a couple of uh, let's say years it will be a necessity people will laugh at this panel if they see it they say oh my gosh they were trying to convince the workforce of flexibility and being accommodating talent this is the future either we are on board or the companies that will ignore this will lose they will lose because talent will keep looking for a great place to work for that has flexibility and they would uh, look for equality and all these values and um, uh, we have amazing talent in our part of the world right but accessibility to transportation is the key challenge for women and where and keeping um, taking care of the kids being the take care of uh, the caretaker in our part of the world uh, is um, something that is changing and will change and must change so this is now we're proposing it we're trying to promote and you know advocate for it but very soon uh, it's it's the future this is the future of workforce for women and for men i agree well that's a great point because i want to just check in with you on do you think men are going to embrace this i mean kirst is certainly hopeful that men will embrace this flexibility and they want to spend more time potentially with family and work flexibly but, but do you believe that men will actually see that and embrace it smart ones will yeah okay <laughs> that's a great answer uh so let's turn to you now because we want to talk about skills and attributes about what uh you know women and, and employees are going to need in the future of work w what are the kind of new skills and attributes that you see that women are going to need to really prosper in the in the future of work well i think rather than going into specific skills uh i'm going to go back to the the reason why i'm not going to go down you know to say like you need to learn machine learning ai and you know, things like that because that, that stuff is constantly changing what we found was that when through the think tank for women in business and technology that we, we ran through fabric we found out that there are six reasons why women are not um you know uh they're not succeeding in a, a, to the top level to the top tiers of uh business and technology and i would say that we need to focus on those six reasons uh, so the six areas which is confidence you know building confidence you know uh, uh, and if you imagine the pandemic has had actually more of a knock-on effect on women's confidence staying home having to uh, uh, thinking about you know how can i do 
uh, how can I, how can uh, I'm falling behind? You know, I have uh, all these things you know, with kids and uh, homeschooling and everything, and I'm falling behind. I'm falling behind the, uh, you know, learning the skills that I need to do for the workplace. So that's actually uh, having a more of a knock-on effect on, on uh, confidence. So we need to really help women gain confidence again, uh, and uh, that's a big area. The other one is tech skills. Obviously, you know, so all of the different areas of tech skills, depending on what uh, line of work you're in, there's uh, increasingly uh, higher levels of comp complexity within the tech area, and it takes time to learn it. So we need to develop and uh, create that kind of space and time for women to be able to, uh, you know, to learn those skills uh, and financial skills. Uh, so uh, this is uh, so far three leadership skills, and then we have women's health issues. You know, uh, the women's health issues is a very, very big area. You know, everything from whether it's PMS, menopause, childbirth, you know, all of the things that are specific to women that we don't talk about. That's like almost like a taboo. A lot of people don't even think about, but they affect women. And we need to think about how that's going to impact in this new hybrid model. And how can we create an environment that is that, uh, that makes them feel welcome to to um, you know to think about those things and overcome them. And finally, is family and relationship support because you know yeah. the. With the, one of the main reasons why women get to their uh, late thirties, sorry, mid um, late twenties and early thirties uh, to mid thirties, and then they don't get to the next level is family and relationship, the lack of support in that area. So that's, I would say, that's the six areas that we need to really focus on. Okay, and let's bring in Matt here because Matt, you're working uh, in customer propositions. You're thinking about the customer. If you think about it from a customer perspective, what are the skills and attributes you want the people in your workforce and the women to to have to be able to deal with? well with those customers yeah I, I think from 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 a customer perspective even before um the crisis uh, covid um the the colleague of today was not going to be the colleague of tomorrow so we were already transitioning at a faster rate each year in in what our customers expected us to deliver to them whether that's digitally or physically so what's happened in that period i think sammy mentioned it earlier is that's just accelerated um, so our customers now expect different things from us on a, on a daily basis and the pace of that change in expectations going up exponentially. It isn't all digital. So, of course, there's a huge push towards a digital, but there's also the people element of it as well. And what we need to recognize is that the, the customers that we're serving uh, you know, look at us and look at how we operate and who we are. And we need to make sure we're adapting our workforce and giving our workforce the tools to be able to support those customers. So. Our customers look different from our colleagues often, right? So we need to make sure that we're matching that requirement, that, that need, uh, and ramping up the pace of, of learning for, for all of our colleagues, but particularly for our female colleagues, who, as, as Somi says, sometimes the, the, the pace of change can be somewhat scary and they have other responsibilities and other priorities. We need to make sure that we, we're aware of that and give them the time and the support that they need to be able to adapt. But our customer expectations are changing just as fast as our, as our colleague expectations and we need to adapt to that yeah yeah super thank you and daniel let's bring you in uh from your perspective with bank had what what kind of uh skills and competence are you looking for for your employees to be able to uh to, to work in the bank I and mean, particularly thinking about customers as well yeah we keep uh, uh, mentioning empathy as a very important um um skill set uh, for uh, to handle you know colleagues and customers that, that one is very important. With all the tech uh, revolution that is going on, empathy, remembering that we're humans, dealing with the humans is very important. And the second one would be resilience. We need be, people to be flexible, the way they think, problem solvers, and uh, being able to handle pressure in a way that will produce outcome rather than anything else. I think uh, those two skills um, are the skills for the future for both for, for both men and women, but especially for women that uh, it's becoming more key in, um, in the future. Plus, being able to be part of this technology revolution for women, because unfortunately in our part of the world, women are less likely to study uh, uh, technology topics or work in technology, but things are shifting. We love, I love what we're seeing in the younger generation on the, you know, the, uh, the change in this mindset is becoming awesome. We can see now, uh, young women being part of uh, 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 the technology revolution in, in our in the Arab world, and that's 
makes me smile. We have a good possibility out there. Thank you. Uh, Kirsty, we want to uh, turn to you. I don't know whether you have anything you want to add on skills and attributes, but I'd also like to kind of turn to you to ask about thinking about the future as well and the optimism that we can have about, you know, how will women thrive in the financial uh, services industry in the future? And what are the what are the biggest opportunities that you see? Well, there's a fabulous link there. And I think, Robert, we know each other a little bit already. I'm always on the optimistic side. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, Daniel used the magic word for me around empathy. And, you know, obviously, I have to be careful in my role not to fall into stereotypes. But what we observed during the crisis is that a new kind of leadership, a new kind of management was required. We needed leaders that were more empathetic, that were listening to the teams, that were capable of making joint decisions rather than top-down decisions, collaborating. So let's say things that are not traditionally associated with the corporate world, I say it like this, in terms of a management skill set, that you might say are more women's skills, I, of course, would say they're a different kind of skill that's less appreciated. So men also that are stronger on the empathy side rather than the authoritarian side might also flourish in this new environment. But I do think that that, that change in mindset of what a leader is moving towards, as Daniel said, an empathetic style, a collaborative style. I think this is an opportunity for women to show what they bring to the workplace. And again, not necessarily because it's gender bias, but because women are used to handling so many things, that flexibility, that resilience that we're going to need in the future. Historically, in lots of places, women are used to playing that role of many roles. I know men for sure can do it, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that from a, from a future of work point of view, we bring something to the workplace that's different now. The empathetic style, definitely the resilient style this is an opportunity for everybody and specifically for women to show how that can be done and, and can be done well i think that Super. the crisis itself didn't didn't invent any new problems every problem that we see now already existed right now we have a light on it right now we can fix it and we all have a lot of skills and a lot of tools at our, our fingertips to uh, to make a new a new workplace together Super. Okay, well, let's turn to Matt, who's um, nodding his head yet again. Uh, must agree with everything you say, Kirsty. I guess. Um, Matt, what do you see as the real opportunities and the optimism, if you like, for women in the future of work? So I think, I mean, the reason I'm agreeing with Kirsty is because we, it sounds like our, our, our programs within our organisations are very similar. So that's, that's a good <laughs> sign because I think that the outcomes of that will be fan fantastic. Look, like I think... Um, I think Daniel made a really good point around um, around talent. Um, the, the, the workforce of the future, there's going to be an expectation uh, from from women that we will give them the capability to, to be who they want to be. Um, and in, if we don't do that, um, then we will lose. Um, we will lose not only from a, an internal colleague perspective, the talent that we've already got will leave and, and we won't attract the right kind of talent, but also we'll lose, we'll lose customer advocacy as well because they are also are expecting us to really make an opportunity here. So, so for me, I think that's the really big opportunity. The firms, the organisations that get this right have a massive opportunity here to be even better. This, the, the data that supports a balanced organisation outcomes is clear. We don't need to debate that a more balanced um, yeah. uh, organization is a stronger organization, both in terms of how it operates, but also in, in terms of its outcomes. You know, the performance metrics that, that you see across the board are always higher across the piece with, with a more balanced organization. So it's a, a massive opportunity, particularly firms like ourselves, who have made really clear commitments to get to a more gender balance, both in terms of, of seniority, but also in terms of things like gender pay gap, those type of things. If we get it right, it's a massive opportunity for us as an organization. If we get it wrong, then the opposite obviously is true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so opportunities for the women, opportunities for you, opportunities for everyone. Um, Daniel, let's bring you in here. What is the uh, source of optimism for women in the, uh, the future of work? Um, well, we at HR, we always say that history predicts future. And um, for us at Bank al Ittihad, our history of inclusion, of hiring more women, capable women at the bank, helped us to uh, um, uh, double the number of women base in the bank as customers. Uh, and that was an amazing result. So if you want to achieve results, I think we need to invest in the right place, which is having more women in the, in the workforce and more women in the top management and on the middle management layer. I think the future of uh, work for women 
is depending on uh, uh, being uh, fair and equal and have opening up opportunities where they will thrive on their own. Just need to give them a fair chance, make it a fair game, and uh, you will see wonders. I believe in our countries, in the, even in the third world countries, if we really give women the space that they should be given, I think we will see better economy and better um, uh, better world, better better living um, conditions for everybody there. So the future really depends if we give that window or not. Otherwise, it will stay gloomy uh, and grey as uh, London's weather right now. Ah, uh, well, absolutely. How did you know it's uh, really yeah. grey and uh, gloomy yeah. here? Uh, Somi, uh, let's give you the last word in that sense on this future for women in the future of work. I mean, what, what what's the optimism that you see? So uh, for me, one of the most exciting things is the uh, shift that we are seeing in terms of the importance of official education, because uh, more and more companies in this new world of technology, they don't necessarily, we don't need to hire people with certain degrees. Self-learning has become more important than ever and opportunities for self-learning is huge. So one of the things that uh, makes it difficult for a lot of women is that they don't even know where to start from. But as long as uh, they can figure out where to start from, the, uh, there are so many amazing courses out there, there's so many amazing opportunities for self-learning that uh, will enable you to learn at a pace, at a speed that is appropriate for the time that we live in. You know, the, this whole idea of going and doing a degree for four years, that is so backward. That it's just like so not 21st century. You know, and because let's say you, you go and learn and get a degree in marketing. A degree in marketing means nothing now because by the time you come out, you know, the marketing has changed so much. So there's so much opportunity for self self learning um, and uh, self-directed learning that will open the door for women uh, in some really unique areas that they can go into uh, to work for companies that really need those things you know those those uh, let's say a company like NatWest or you know uh, Bank uh, Etihad you know like these companies now they need to communicate with their uh, potential audiences in a unique way on through social media, through uh, through you know new channels, new ways of communicating with them, in a way that is not taught during uh, uh, in school in in education. So I think that's a huge opportunity for women that they can do self learning at home, you know, with, while they are having kids, you know, just they just need the support, the inspiration to keep going and learn and then grab those unique new roles that are being created in company. That's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess it's really interesting to know to what extent can organizations support self-learning? And exactly. you know, maybe we could turn to that in a minute. But we have a question um, from our uh, audience. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And and Daniel, I'm going to come to you first and then I'm going to come to Kirsty because um, it's about measuring gender pay gaps. OK, so that's a, a, a kind of you know, great HR question and DNI question. Um, so so how are you looking at gender pay gaps and how are you measuring them, Daniel? I'll start with you. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one, because uh, what we uh, did is we took all the jobs. We were wondering, we, this is a new thing for in our part of the world, you know, this gender gap um, uh, for pay is something that is not very common at all. Uh, but what we did is we took all the, the jobs in the bank and we did some analysis. We, uh, we put, uh, we blinded our eyes and we compared the numbers to see if we have that gap or not. And guess what? We found almost zero difference between men and women who are doing the same job, the same, the same title. And that was very re refreshing for us. It means we are, um, when we put on the gender lens, we don't have any discrimination or bias. It's only linked to job and performance. And that was in most jobs. But of course, there is always a lot to do, right? A lot of more fairness and more equality to offer, but we found most of the jobs have a zero uh, gender gap. Okay. okay. Um, so let's bring in Kirsty then. So tell us uh, from a DNI specialist point of view, how are you uh, measuring gender pay in AXA, and uh, uh, what 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 do you, how you know how are you following up on it? 
Yeah, and a huge topic for us. And luckily, just to be clear, now this sits with our comp and Ben's team. We have specialist numbers people. I'm a, I'm a people person, so we have the numbers people looking. But just to, to explain a subtle difference there, because, of course, with us being in so many countries, there are laws now in the UK, for example, in France, about reporting these gaps. And what they do is not exactly what Daniel described, but they take all the women's pay and all the men's pay and they compare. And this, I think, possibly, Daniel, even in your case, would give you a gap because what happens in organizations, especially in financial services, is that you have more men in senior positions. So when you talk about pure gender pay gap, we still have a significant gap. And this is good for us to measure and track because it shows fundamental change. And we will never close that until we have an equal number of senior women at the top. So it drives a lot of positive action and we follow it. But this is very long term change. When we look at the example that Daniel gave of equal pay, so same same job, uh, same money, we have a very small gap in some countries. These things happen. Uh, we've got budget in those countries to close, and we intend to close all unfair uh, gender pay gap by 2023. So you can imagine with the amount of geographies we're in, this was a huge task, but we took it. We did an extremely detailed study, and we're really committed to to removing them. And in fact, now in my team, we're going the, to the next step. And I, 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 I let Daniel maybe do the same check when he goes back, because when you talk about performance, of course, the performance at a certain point is subjective. And we, we need to find a way to measure to see if when we judge performance, if we judge men and women in the same way. So right now we're starting to look at how can we look at the data to see if we, we equally attribute or what goes on when people give performance ratings. But this is quite a, a detailed piece of work that we do next. But uh, equal pay gap, a uh, gender pay gap, sorry, we track it. We realize it's systemic, it's a long term job, it will keep me busy for some years, fortunately. Equal pay for equal job, we, we aim to be absolutely closed on that gap uh, by the end of next year. And then we're also looking at what might drive those differences to make sure that we don't start moving apart again yeah. between the equality yeah. of pay. Great, thanks, uh, Kirsty. And now there's a question here from Rhonda uh, on parental leave. And what role are we believe that leadership plays uh, in uh, basically being a role model potentially, uh, but to particularly to change the corporate culture? I know. Let's bring in Matt here. I know Matt, whether uh, you've got much experience of, of, of parental leave and paternity leave, but but I've been thinking about it from a leadership perspective. Um, how can leaders change the culture uh, and uh, um, you know, and really you know signify that things are changing? Yeah, I think Kirsty is very keen to come in on that one. I think, look, from my perspective, just speaking personally, so so my kids are grown up now. I think it's I, I would hand on heart say I missed out hugely as they grew up. And when I uh, when I was um, when my kids were younger, the parental leave uh, policies at the bank I was working at, not where I am now, were were very dis. You know, first of all, they weren't good enough for women, and they certainly weren't good enough for men. So. I didn't have an option to do it. Um, I think the point that was made earlier around you know, men taking up those opportunities is really important. And as a leader today, if I was having kids again, which by the way, I'm not planning to do, but if I did, it's, it's beholden on someone like myself to set the tone um, and, and make sure that, that, that support is given to colleagues who take parental leave. It should have no impact whatsoever on their overall performance and opportunities. But as a, as, a, as a man, we need to make sure we're maximising those opportunities for ourselves as well. And, and talking to colleagues in my team who, who, have, who are just having children at the moment, men are as keen as the women to take time out, spend time with their kids, find a balance between, the, you know, between both parents. So that, that has definitely changed. And if you look at the millennials um, and, and sort of the, the, the next generation coming through, it's an expectation that both parents play more of a role. Um, and, and companies need to make sure we're giving that flexibility. So I think it's really important for leaders to set the tone and, and first of all, use the opportunities they're given themselves, but also to be fully understanding of, of a balance for, for parental leave um, for, for both genders. Thanks. Uh, and Kirsty, I know you're keen to come in here. So come on, tell us what you're thinking. I was, about. sorry. I couldn't resist. But it, actually, it was perfect that Matt went first because he couldn't have set me up in a better way. What a great testimony. And, and, and this was our idea back in 2017 when we looked at parental leave because I believe that setting up the arrival of a, of a baby into a family well from the start and involving both parents right from the start sets the tone then. And that's what changes women's careers uh, in terms of being able to come back in and having a, a fully hands-on partner so we offered something to men and women um 
in all of our geographies. So depending where you live in the world, this will either sound generous or not very impressive. But keeping in mind that we operate in every geography, we offer fully paid um, primary parent leave for 16 weeks. Where there's somebody giving birth, that is the person that gives birth. In any kind of relationship where there isn't somebody giving birth, so it can be an adoption, it can be in a same-sex relationship, then they can choose who, which is the parent that gets the 16 weeks. And then the co-parent, often, um, often the father, gets four weeks fully paid. Now this is still not the same. Some this was back in 2017. Now some, some companies now are more equalized in that respect, but still, we believe that it's important when you welcome a child, that it's a big moment in your career, in reality, and Matt's been through it like I have, it's a tiny moment, even though it feels like taking four weeks out feels desperately serious. But it can be done, it should be done. We need the men to do it. So although we've put it in place, I agree with you, Matt, we really rely on people to do it and be seen to do it and to take it seriously. Um, but when we talk about changing gender roles and society, making men as involved in parenting as women is one of the deep things that we need to do to make that change. So for us, Parental leave is very important and also from parental leave is very important in terms of managing that transition back into the workplace. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks Robert. But I, 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 yeah, I wanted to share our story. <laughs> no, no, it's brilliant. Actually, it's a great story. Uh, and look, we're uh, unfortunately uh, coming to the end of uh, our, our session. Uh, Somi, I'd like to give the last word to you since you uh, kind of opened up so eloquently. Uh, all the things you've heard uh, from the panel here and the discussion we've had, um, what's your thought about, you know, kind of, how we go forward with this and um, really kind of start to create these opportunities for women to thrive in the future of work. What's your kind of big takeaway? I think the most important thing to remember is that for women to win, men don't have to lose as uh, our, uh, you know, technology Shafani uh, Jyoti always says. Um, it's really important that we realize that we are all in this together. And if we want the future of workforce to be successful, we need um, to work together it's super important that we work together and just like Kirsty said you know it, uh, having a uh, bringing a child into this world is something that needs to be thought about and uh, it, ha it has to be a, a coordination from both sides right so so family and relationship is one of the most important reasons why women fall behind and it's something that's very close to my heart because I had to make a decision to make a choice between career and relationship and actually that had an impact and I chose my career so I, I ended up not deciding not to have children so it's really important um, if that if we were in a different society where we had that level of support i may have had a different kind of you know uh, trajectory of my own choice of motherhood or or otherwise so um i i think it's super important for big corporations to uh enable women you know so that women are not being penalized for having children for for being uh, uh, you know the caretakers you know they are having the double burden of both uh, you know having doing both and because then that has a knock-on effect on their health it has a knock-on effect on their you know confidence on their ability to uh, to catch up with their tech skills with their uh, with their leadership skills with their financial skills so those six things they are all related to each other and it's a combination of biology and culture and we have to work together for a better future for our um, for our species. Wow, Somi, thank you very much. That's a wonderful way to end. Now, I was assuming that someone would come along and say uh, the panel's over, uh, guys, because the time's up, and I haven't heard anything yet. So, actually, one more panelist might be able to get a word in edgeways before we finalise uh, the end of the panel. So, uh, come on, Kirsty, you're smiling away there. Add, add something <laughs> to that. Well, then let me add something positive. I, I rebound again. Somi told us right at the beginning, we have between one and five years to make a change. And that change is in our hands. This is an incredible moment. We are rebuilding the way that we work right now. We've had an opportunity that's opened up. Let's rebuild a workplace that works. I'm looking at Matt for our clients, but also for the men and women out there that want to be active in the workplace, but also want a fulfilling life and to be able to balance the two. And I believe that if we talk, collaborate, and decide together that that's something that we we can all have a hand in and be proud of when we eventually retire if we ever do <laughs> uh, okay well look, we've got apparently two minutes left so daniel oh. and matt come on you've got to say Go give men the one. last word give men the word, last word for a change and uh, tell us you know uh, you know how we can get um working together on this women and men yeah so i mean i think sony said it really well that that men don't have to lose 
for women to succeed. And, and I think that's something we really need to push hard because I, I, you know, there is obviously a, um, a potential concern uh, in the male community that this push for gender is, is going to impact them negatively. I, I just don't agree with that. Um, I look at the, the huge capabilities that, that women bring to the, the balance they bring, the different opinions, the different views they bring to the table. It's hugely beneficial to us as an organization, but also individ, into, as individuals. So I think it is a win-win. And I think we really need to push that message really hard and, and to get together collaboratively, we can succeed here. I also agree with the comment that it's now. Um, right. I've been involved in diversity and in inclusion for a long time. feel like I put a lot of effort in and not necessarily sure I've moved the needle as much as I would like. The last 12 months have, is a, a real unique opportunity and we have to grab it with both hands. And what I'm seeing from individuals, this panel, but also organisations, including NatWest, is we are absolutely going for that. And you know, I'm really excited about the next, uh, the next 12 to 18 months. Super. Uh, so um, apparently now the main summit is back. Uh, so sorry, Daniel, I promised you the last word, but we might not have time. You, at least you better catch your plane. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, panel. You've been absolutely fabulous. And thank you for the questions from the audience. Uh, get back to the main summit, all of us, and, uh, and let's enjoy the rest of the, uh, uh, the, rest of the uh, uh, summit. So thanks very much and goodbye. Thank you.